welcome everybody to Disrupt Ed TV, where every little idea could make a big difference in your classroom or your school. Mm -hmm. And in this episode, we're continuing a conversation we're, we're having with two terrific guests, uh, Philip Rogers, who is the Executive Director of the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification, NASDAQ, mm -hmm. NASDAQ. and also uh, Troy Hutchings, who is with the Educational Testing Service Company in Princeton, New Jersey. Right. Uh, Troy, your expertise is you do research that uh, informs the educators on the subject of ethics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to continue a conversation we had in a prior episode. Uh, the last episode focused primarily on the big story on Action News, which is generally, let's say, jet sexual uh, malpractice or ethics conduct. Ethics conduct yeah. But really, the, the subject of teacher ethics is much larger. Oh, and yeah. uh, in that episode, you mentioned, uh, Phil, that you've developed, NASDAQ has developed a code of ethics as of 2015, it governs all teaching, various aspects of it. Well, it doesn't govern as much as it provides support, and it, mm -hmm. we like to think of it as a, a professional, a conversation about professional practice for teachers mm -hmm. okay. uh, that now exists, that hasn't existed for 150 years of public school history. Mm -hmm. And while many organizations had, had established what they call codes of ethics, if you read them, they really look more like codes of conduct, mm -hmm. right? more about don't do this or this will happen, where a code of ethics Ask, helps you ask yourself a whole series of questions about the appropriateness mm -hmm. of what is happening in your classroom mm -hmm. and, and, and your own actions as an educator. So the Model Code of Ethics is on our website. It's free. Uh, it can be adopted or adapted. We call it the Model Code because maybe a school district wants to make some changes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we recommend sure. that we really see the value of this is not as much for state agencies. Our members are made up of the state agencies that process uh, professional credentials for educators. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they give certificates, but they also then have the responsibility of taking away certificates. So our members in NASDAQ also prosecute misconduct cases, which are oftentimes prosecuted at an administrative level, not a criminal level. And so that's where the clearinghouse comes in, and that's why it's important for, uh, while already all 50 states check the NASDAQ clearinghouse before they give a certificate for, to an out-of-state applicant to make sure they didn't lose their certificate somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now it's important because we let school districts have access to it. They can now check it for their hires, both certified and non-certified. Um, and one of the reasons is that it is an administrative process so if you're, let's say so a teacher is in Florida and they have misconduct and they are, they, their case is now before the agency that handles teacher cert certificates in Florida. Since it will take, it oftentimes can take two or three years to prosecute that case. Mm -hmm. if they avail themselves to all the appeals that mm -hmm. are in the due process of taking their certificate away. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, that teacher leaves and go to another, goes to another state mm -hmm. where they get a certificate their name's not in the NASDAQ database because the case is not final. Mm -hmm. So now they have a certificate and they're teaching in another case. Okay. As soon as it's entered, that new state will know it and they will take their certificate. Right. But what if they don't apply for a job as a, that requires a certificate? They apply for another job. There'd be no way the school district would know. Now mm -hmm. they can. Okay. So the model code of ethics is the guiding force, the guiding conversation mm that helps teachers make the right decisions. And it's, um, for us, I guess it's, Troy was the uh, subject matter expert on that, and uh, the development of it was quite the experience for all of us. Yeah, yeah it was a remarkable experience, and, and it really started back in 2014, and, and Phil, as executive director of NASDAQ, really gathered together many of the other um, heads of other professional organizations that kind of undergird our profession, the education profession, meaning the NEA and AACTE and AFT and um, CAPE and others as well that are very influential um, in terms of not just organizational members but also policy that, that really assist the profession. And, and brought them all together and, and really we discussed this, this gap that seemed to exist in the profession and, and they agreed and they said, yes, we see a gap, we want to participate, we'd love to nominate some of our stellar members to serve um, as as members of a task force to create the model code of ethics for educators. Hmm. And so that's exactly what happened. So it is, it is, um, it was a task force made up of 20 practitioners and 
and they were, um, we had paraprofessionals, we had teachers, assistant principals, principals, superintendents. So they were practicing educators. That was critical. Right. Um, through the history of, by examining how other codes of ethics for other professions were created, we kind of followed a very similar model. Hmm. And, and that model was to, to put it in the hands of practitioners to create a code for their own profession, you know? What's, what's exciting to me about this as you're describing it, Troy, is that it's not about fixing broken teachers. Right. It's about taking good educators and making them great. So really, a code of ethics really is establishing a standard of excellence that teachers can aspire to. And I, right. think that's, I think that's very compelling. That's sort of number one. And number two, to pick up on a point that we made just before the, before the program we were talking about, 3.3 million teachers, 99.999% of those teachers are already behaving in a highly ethical way. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's a, the absence of those ethical standards, so that make that, that make it, uh, make it possible for teachers to earn. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that's important, a lot of states will uh, have been using uh, surveys for uh, work conditions for mm -hmm. teachers. And they're called, I think they call them tell surveys, but uh, in Kentucky we conducted it every year. Number one reason a teacher leaves the school, conflict. Really? Yes. Hmm. It may be feeling unsupported or resources. What the model code of ethics, not only for these egregious cases that we've been talking right. about that are make the we'll front lines, but the model code of ethics is there for that teacher who is struggling in the classroom and who is not happy in the classroom for one reason or another, could be a conflict with a colleague. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be um, a struggle with other kind of things that they deal with in those 3,000 decisions they make every day mm -hmm. that will eventually affect their efficiency and their effectiveness as an educator. Mm -hmm. The model code also helps them make those decisions. How does it help with the effectiveness? Because it, they are no longer left alone to, to struggle with those decisions that they're having to make, mm -hmm. they now have a professional language that discusses what they're mm -hmm. coping with in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that helps them not only be um, more confident in their teaching, mm -hmm. and if they're confident in their teaching, mm -hmm. guess what? They're also become more effective. They're a teacher. more effective right. teacher, which mm -hmm. is a good, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I become a better teacher, right. and at the same time I'm also becoming a safer teacher. Right. Yeah. So, so a, code of, a code of ethics really acknowledges that a profession is far better off when we work together right. mm -hmm. um, to, yeah, right. when we have a collective set of ideals as opposed to trying to self-assess as individuals mm -hmm. how to handle particular situations. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an amazing concept, but it's, it's so common in other professions. Right. Yeah, that's great. Right. So now you mentioned too, Phil, before the program that NASDAQ has a, a, a universal scope across all states. Mm -hmm. The uh, model code of ethics was developed to fit within the framework of every one of the 50 states of the United States. Right. Mm -hmm. So it covers all those Not bases. only every state, but we really see it for every school. It becomes a language not only for educators, mm -hmm. but it's a language that parents can use. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if, a, if a school says we have adopted the model code of ethics for educators, and, and we, have, we have written it in such a way that we give permission don't call it the model code of ethics. Call mm -hmm. it um, um, RFK Elementary right. Code of Ethics. Mm -hmm. Let mm -hmm. it be yours. Own it. Uh, we provided some wonderful language. Maybe mm -hmm. you want to tweak that a little bit. But once you do that, then the parents know what the, the code of ethics for that school is. They, they, they understand it. The community knows. The reporters yeah. who cover the stories yeah. now know. Yeah. And they can, they can reference the code of ethics. The, the supervisors of the teachers know. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a, a professional language that goes across the scope of the school, the district, and the community. It's terrific. And we need to take a break. But when we come back, uh, what I'll ask you to do, I think, is to walk us through the right. model code of ethics. Okay. Okay. How big is it? How easy is it to sure. read? Uh, so we'll be back with uh, more Troy Hutchings and Phil Rogers uh, after these messages on Disrupt Ed TV. Be right back. Great. Our culture is what we believe in and our brand is what we do in our work. When our brand and our culture are in alignment with each other, we become more than just good. We become excellent. 
Think of this alignment as a mix of flavors in our water cooler. When we gather around and drink it ourselves, we're savoring our culture. When we serve it to our friends and neighbors, we're expressing our brand. So, what's in your water cooler? For groups of all kinds and sizes, our Brand and Culture Alignment Toolkit will provide you with a unique water cooler recipe that expresses and makes you the very best at what you do. It all starts with a simple, affordable 20-minute online survey. Completely confidential, you can take it whenever suits your schedule. Within two days, you'll receive a BCAT report that expresses your team's signature brand and culture in plain English and includes simple exercises that will help align your team's leaders, stakeholders, and members. Planning a large-scale event or conference? Consider Brookdale Community College and its versatile Collins Arena. The Collins Arena is the premier venue for all kinds of corporate and community events, live concerts and celebrity happenings, trade shows and expositions, sporting events and tournaments. The Collins Arena has countless layout options to meet your needs. Bring your next event to life at the Collins Arena at Brookdale Community College. Go to brookdalecc.edu slash events and start planning your next event now. Welcome back to Disrupt Ed TV. My name is Al Cini. I'm Joe Asamendi. And uh, we're back with Troy Hutchings of ETS and yeah. Phil Rogers of NASA. Mm -hmm. And during the break, we were talking about how probably a very small percentage of teachers have actually seen the model code of ethics. So maybe we can start this segment by asking the two of you maybe to describe it. How mm -hmm. approachable is it? Who could read it? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Uh, Troy, do you want to start? Well, sure. I'll just I'll just kind of break it down. So the, the model code of ethics for educators is is actually very manageable in length. Mm -hmm. um, it's got five overriding principles, if you will, and then it's got different categories underneath those. But the real meat of the model code is in the standards, and there are eighty six mm -hmm. standards, mm -hmm. and 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 one has to they they can't approach it like. Um, uh, a manual to put together a barbecue grill or something right. like that. You, mm -hmm. you just can't do that. You have to understand that these are collective standards and they've been vetted through all kinds of ethical dilemmas, all kinds of cases, and they're to provide guidance and to prompt a discussion, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of them, is to spark to spark the discussion and give a framework for a direction that uh, for, for decision making. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really the critical piece. So it's, it's manageable in that sense. Now, if, if you think about other professions, um, some professions, like the American Medical Association, has a very uh, extensive code of ethics that mm. is, uh, you know, well over 100 pages long. So there are differences with different professions, but we feel as though this is really appropriate, and it will also be improved and changed, like all other codes of ethics, over time, so that it's always applicable and relevant to the current practicing educator. But that's great. Actually, I read it too, as I said before our interview yeah. here. I read through it, and I, and I could understand it. I'm not an educator, right. and I think it's important because we talked about education with the community, with parents, as well as teachers, right. and principals and supervisors. So I think it's written in a way that people can relate to it and not get caught up. And I'm not a professional. Sure. That's uh, that's very that's very important. So it's an approachable document that anybody can understand. It's mm -hmm. designed that way. And it's designed as a living document. Right. It'll be updated over time. It is. We, when, when the uh, NASDAQ Executive Board, and, it's, and I think it needs to be clear, the model code is not, doesn't belong to NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. We sort of helped uh, foster it and parent it, and we have the responsibility of sheltering it and, and helping it grow. Mm -hmm. But it really belongs to the profession. Mm -hmm. But it has to reside somewhere, so it resides with NASDAQ, and we take that uh, responsibility very seriously. And when we developed, the, the model code was developed, uh, I went back to my executive board and I said, you know, what happens to these documents is that they are developed, and there's a lot of energy around them, and then they go sit on the shelf and become outdated mm -hmm. before anybody looks at them. So out of the, the, the NASDAQ executive board, uh, began to provide some leadership, and we developed what we call the National Council for the Advancement of Educator Ethics. Mm -hmm. And the people on that board uh, make up that council are professional educators, 
And they have the responsibility of not only keeping it a living document, mm -hmm. but helping to disseminate it, and helping to get it out there and get resources to support it mm -hmm. so that it becomes um, very usable. Mm -hmm. And so we have an entire council of people who have the responsibility to make sure it stays viable mm -hmm. and it stays usable. Mm -hmm. It's That's relevant, key. it's not cast in concrete, That's it can right. be changed That's as right. 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 Uh, the, we like to think of our program as a way to get the word out on subjects like this, and so it's a, a real privilege and honor for us to be helping getting the mm -hmm. word out. The people who watch our program have a notepad and a pen kind of at the end of the table, figuratively. We're hoping they'll have meetings, and as the core of those meetings, they could go online, get a copy of the Model Code of Ethics, uh, and then have conversations, open conversations about different points in those ethics, right. I think. And they're free to pull the, the Model Code off the, the website and if they want to put their name on it, all we ask is just make a citation so people know where, knows where it came from. Right. Uh, but it's, it's free. Uh, and uh, they can look at the, the teachers who were on it. Uh, one of the facilitators who led this group mm -hmm. uh, said it's a, the, that the model code was created by educators for educators. It's mm. important to me, to, for, the, for everyone out there watching your program, to know that this was not put together by bureaucrats in a state agency. Mm, right, right. This was put together by educators, many of them national board certified educators, many of them teachers of the year in their state, just a blue ribbon group mm -hmm. of educators. People who really care about the profession mm -hmm. and want to make sure that it's it's the best it can be. Absolutely. And I think that's what, yeah. So it's all the best intentions in this. Right. Uh, Troy, you mentioned, I think, uh, before the, well, actually during the break, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you have efficacy studies, that you've gotten proof that the model code of conduct. Sure, code of ethics sure. Works. So uh, a year ago, um, um, we, we decided to, to do a multi-method efficacy study. And efficacy mm -hmm. is really just an academic word for saying, does it do what it's supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Does it really promote the conversation? Does it allow... Um, teachers and, and, and all educators to really have a difficult conversation about the issues that right. they face every day. Hmm. And, and so what I was able to do was to go to an elementary school um, in Louisiana and, and I did a five-hour workshop as a part of this multi-method study mm -hmm. in just the model code of ethics for educators mm -hmm. and, and trained them in the model code and how to use it and gave numbers of case studies and we did all kinds of things that were um, fun um, exciting, but allowed them to really play with the model code, kind of mm -hmm. play in the sandbox, if you will, okay. with this document. Mm -hmm. And then what I did was I, I came back two months later, mm -hmm. and then as a part of the multi-method study, I, I did surveys pre and post, but then I also did two months later, I did um, extensive interviews and collected narrative data as well to find out what happened in the two months. Mm. And I asked the principal and the administrators at the school not to intervene at all, mm -hmm. not to have any faculty meetings on ethics, but rather just let it percolate mm -hmm. organically. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty interesting because um, a uh, hundred percent of the people in the interview said it, it greatly impacted their practice in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And some of the simple things were now when the professional learning communities or the grade levels would meet once a week, instead of being focused on just curricular issues, now they're focusing on the complexities of their job mm -hmm. and how to handle certain situations. There had been um, a number of things that had happened in those two months that some teachers talked about. I, at the elementary level, there's often a great deal of pressure from parents to stay in constant communication via social media okay. with their student's teacher. Mm -hmm. And some teachers begin to realize how that could be viewed as a conflict of interest. Sure. And they felt comfortable now in approaching a parent and saying, you know, I really can't do that. And the parent, of course, the parent would say, oh, you must have a new rule at the school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a new policy. And they say, no, this is about conflict of interest. It's about right. professional ethics. And of course the parent goes, I get it, I understand. Wow. And that makes a big difference. There, mm -hmm. was, there was another, um, uh, yeah, just there's all kinds of situations that, that just emerged. One teacher said, you know, the model code is this living, breathing document, but honestly, I don't feel the need to refer to it all the time. Because now that we're all conversant mm -hmm. in professional ethics, we have each other. Right. And then on occasion, we go back to the document when we need to. That is, Bingo. That's, when, it's, when it's mindless, it's telling tales. When it's right. mindful, it's peer advisory. Right. It's, peer, it's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of advisory and yeah. uh, so uh, peer that, accountability, which is right. great. Right. So that yeah. kind of a comment uh, you know, leads me to believe that it's, it's a document that is really meant to be kind of a, the tip of a spear point. Sure. You know, it's not the answer. 
but it opens up the answer to those who have the it's, answers, it's right. the, and that's the practitioners. It's yeah. a right. safe way to start a conversation about a touchy subject, right. about several touchy subjects. Right. Uh, we, we need to take a break. When we come back, though, I want to talk about all the other subjects, not just right. sexual misconduct, but all the other various aspects that are covered in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the model code. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back with more Disrupted TV and two terrific guests, Troy Hutchings and Phil Rogers, after these messages. Absolutely. Okay. The U.S. Army is committed to developing a strong future for its soldiers, providing them with a substantial variety of educational programs and benefits. Now the Army is making that same commitment to students across the nation with March to Success, a self-paced online course designed to help students graduate from high school and to prepare them for transition into college. Offering seven free practice tests for ACT and SAT, March to Success has proven to increase performance on standardized tests. In addition to enhancing skills in high school math and English, March to Success includes STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math. For students seeking a more challenging curriculum, the College Readiness Online course offers advanced studies in English and math. March to Success is an invaluable resource for students, educators, and parents with materials developed by Petersons, a leading provider of solutions for the education community for over 40 years. Focusing on materials for grades 8 through 12, March to Success provides around-the-clock access to online learning, test prep, study skills, and individual coursework remediation. Using cutting-edge assessment software to present world-class educational content in an easy-to-use format designed to accelerate the student learning curve for state assessment testing, as well as SAT and ACT practice and preparation. This course can enhance and refresh students' knowledge while improving high school competency and college readiness. With March to Success's unsurpassed interactive online test prep system, every individual's learning path is unique. The system provides an array of subject-specific assessments and remedial courses tailored to students' educational needs, focusing on achievable goals and strategic learning. Students have the option to select part or all sections of courses offered within the site, participating in individualized instruction with self-paced lessons and timed practice tests. Students have access to comprehensive course materials and hundreds of practice questions covering a wide variety of subjects including study skills, language arts, and STEM preparation. From pre-assessment to a customized learning path, students can reinforce and demonstrate what they have learned. Each module provides results for every practice question, along with the correct answers and instructive feedback for incorrect answers. The High School Science Hub features 21 different lessons and hundreds of practice test questions across four subjects, while the College Readiness Online course offers advanced level study in English, math, and writing. Social Sciences, Technology, and Pre-Engineering hubs cover essential skills and content included in STEM standards. The Nursing Hub covers important subjects required to pass entrance exams for nursing and allied health programs. In addition to almost 2,000 practice questions covering multiple categories, the Math Hub includes extra learning modules with interactive exercises, providing remediation through the use of animation, drag and drop exercises, and clickable steps to create an engaging learning experience. Interactive verbal and math flashcard decks in varying levels of difficulty keep students feeling challenged and motivated as they learn and develop their skills. March to Success is the perfect study tool for students preparing for state mandated assessment exams and college admission exams. March to Success includes seven full-length practice tests for both SAT and ACT, 25 decks of flashcards, and a video game designed to help raise ACT and SAT exam scores. Each practice test section is timed and scored to mimic the structure of the real exam. Automated scoring with detailed answer explanations lets students review their results based on either the SAT or ACT scoring methods. In fact, students and monitors have the ability to view results for all lessons and practice tests in real time, with results broken down by subject area and percent of correct or incorrect answers. The site also includes information to guide students through the entire college application process. Students will have access to guides for admissions, financial aid, and scholarship resources. If you'd like to monitor your students' progress, the March to Success website allows educators, parents, or mentors to do just that. 
This tool allows you to view students' login frequency, how many times they are accessing specific courses, information about test scores, and lessons completed. Monitors can even create and customize student groups by class or subject, thus simplifying their management needs. March to Success is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's completely free of charge and free of obligation. To enroll, visit marchtosuccess.com, click the registration button, and answer a few quick questions. Equip your students with the tools to succeed, whether they plan on attending college, a trade school, entering the military, or applying for a job. March to Success can help them achieve their goals and prepare for the next steps in their career development. The use of March to Success is only limited by a student's, teacher's, or parent's imagination. The Army's commitment to a strong future. Welcome back to Disrupt Ed TV. My name is Al Sini. I'm Joe Osmendi. Uh, Joe, there, we couldn't have found two better guests I for a program on, on uh, teacher ethics right. than uh, Phil Rogers of NASDAQ and Troy Hutchings from the Educational Testing Service in Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the break, we were talking about how we might open this segment. And I, you know, I know, Phil, you're you feel strongly about the difference between a code of conduct and a code of ethics, so maybe you can outline. And, that, and, and that's the real issue, and I had to find clarity on it, and Troy helped get me to a place where I could understand it. Mm. But then I had, to, I had to think about what it meant in a, in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. But so many schools have, and so many districts and states have what they call a code of ethics. Mm. But when you read it, you realize it is all about you shall not do this, you mm. shall not do that, mm. and if you do, this is what happens. Mm. And that, that's a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't help a teacher make decisions in the classrooms. It okay. strikes fear in their heart maybe, but all of that is about an action that has already happened. It's mm -hmm. not about uh, helping you with decisions in the classroom that you have to make every day with your interaction with your colleagues, with students, with parents, with the community. Mm -hmm. The difference as I understand it in my, in my mind is a code of conduct is like a stop sign. Mm -hmm. it, it's, there's no um, question what you're supposed to do. You pull up, you stop. If you don't, if you roll through it, um, which I'm sure none of us here have ever done, Never. Um, Never. then you have broken the law and mm -hmm. they can take action against you. Mm -hmm. And you have no recourse. It's just the consequence of breaking the law. Mm -hmm. The code of ethics, on the other hand, is like the yellow sign that you see before a series of curves on the road where it just shows you the, the curvy road that's up ahead. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are, are experienced drivers immediately and maybe even unconsciously make those questions. How, are my tires in good shape? Is the road dry? Uh, am I driving too fast? Is there more traffic on the road? Am I on my side? All of that happens almost instantly, but they are decisions that we make at that moment when we see that sign. Mm -hmm. A code of ethics is like that. Mm -hmm. It's meant to help educators, parents, the community, schools, school board members, it gives them a common language mm. to discuss the issues mm -hmm. that surround a teacher's work in the classroom, but more importantly, it provides that teacher with the um, questions that they have to ask themselves mm -hmm. as they are dealing with what's going on in their classroom. Yeah, that's a great analogy and it's a great distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that, Phil. But uh, Troy, you mentioned during the break that you could think of a particular scenario sure. that if the code of, uh, code of ethics were available, it might have prevented it. Right. Very possible, and, and I, I love the, the metaphor that Phil just used because mm -hmm. the, the road conditions allow for the variability right. mm -hmm. in decision making, mm -hmm. which might be different from school to school, teacher to teacher, um, groups of teachers between groups of teachers. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking about an example that, that happened with um, uh, a, a teacher in a particular state where their district was very interested and in what they call at-risk students. And they wanted their teachers to mentor at-risk students. Mm -hmm. So they asked five teachers in the district to, to choose a student that they felt might be in jeopardy of not graduating and then mentor them. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful, mm -hmm. but what does that mean? And what kind of boundaries are in place? And, and what kind of questions should they be asking as they take on that responsibility? Mm -hmm. Such questions like, 
what kind of communication should I use? Should that communication only take place during school? Should it take place after school? Would texting be okay to mentor a student? Hmm. Because when you mentor a student, it's not just about academic mentoring, it's about social emotional wellness of the student as well. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, um, uh, one particular teacher um, had five felony charges brought against him. Really? Yeah, and he had the felony charges brought against him by the mother of the student that he was mentoring. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the records, you would say, yes, he had 23 phone calls after 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Yes, he had 2,000 text messages over a period of time. But really, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And of course, he said, and the other teacher mentor said, yes, we were expected to do that, so we all did that. However, the problem was that they didn't tell the students that that they were going to be mentored. The parents didn't know yeah. mm. that the students were being targeted as at risk right. and would be mentees to a teacher. Mm. And there was an assumption that the teachers would know what it meant to mentor. Uh, when they've never been prepared mm -hmm. um, and had any kind of training in that very complex relationship mm -hmm. um, outside of the school setting. And so what happened, and I, and I think about this, and by the way, the, the teacher was acquitted in all five charges. Mm. Oh, okay but was removed from the classroom from a year. Mm -hmm. His name is everywhere on all websites right. um, because he had charges brought against him. Sure. Oh, so wow. that really escalated, um, the, the, it escalated the, the sens sensationalism of, of the particular case. Sure. And I keep yeah. thinking, because this happened, um, the mentoring happened before the Code of Ethics came out. And I mm -hmm. keep thinking about this. Right. If there was a Code of Ethics at that time, and all the parties, when, when, when the district wanted to have the mentoring program, if they sat down with the teachers and said, you know what, Th this is kind of risky. It's good, it's important, it's something that we believe we should do to fulfill our mission as an institution, mm -hmm. but let's see if there are any things that we should really examine. Mm -hmm. Well, a big part of the Model Code of Ethics talks about communication mm -hmm. and social media and right. technology. It doesn't say do or don't. It just right. says, it, it says just be, be, be mindful of, be, be, mindful be aware of. of. Be aware, that think about the consequences of this. And, and think about these principles of transparency when you do communicate and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And I really think it really would have made a difference. And, and we could go on and on and talk about all kinds of examples. Remember, codes of conduct are only about punishment. Mm. Right. It, it, that's the five felonies, right? right? Exactly. Uh -huh. But codes of ethics are about prevention right. and about take, examining the complexities that we feel and we have in our profession and applying an external standard Mm -hmm. And that's the collective standards that the profession has agreed upon. Apply that to our decision making mm -hmm. and then launch into our decisions. Ah. I, I really feel like that example um, is pretty clear, but that's just one of many. One of many uh, examples. One of many. That's yeah, why. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm getting from this is, a, let's say, as a teacher, putting myself in the role of somebody who might be watching the program, is that right. if I'm going to have some kind of a social media interaction with a student, Maybe what I'd want to do beforehand is let the parents know that I'm about to engage uh, in, in this way with their, with their child. Maybe include the parents as a CC on messages that I send the child so that they're aware of it. Sure. I mean, all these things are ways, mm -hmm. all these things are communication points right. that the uh, code of ethics would help me be mindful of so that I'm less likely to paint myself. Right, the because if we were just to sit down and discuss them without a set of standards, uh -huh. then it just becomes personal judgment, personal right. morality, or even survival mechanisms that have worked for me before. Right. Oh, I've been a teacher for 30 years, this always works. Well, that that might not that be may not work yeah. in the, the most appropriate or exactly, Twitter. in this particular sure. situation. Yep. So to have something that is relevant and mindful and created by practitioners that has mm -hmm. been vetted by the public um, is, is really a helpful thing. And then again, it contributes to that standard of care right, that exactly. we should all have in mm -hmm. our decision making. Very important. Al, let me just say a word about mm. something we have not mentioned. Mm. And that is the role of the Model Code of Ethics in educator preparation programs. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and many programs, uh, when they are looking for good teachers, mm. Mm. they will say, we're looking for teachers who know the content, mm -hmm who know the pedagogy or how to teach, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have the dispositions to be a good teacher. That means they're caring, mm -hmm. compassionate mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. people. Uh, and and to, you know, to quote Woody Allen, they, they show up. They show up. That's a disposition that's important exactly. uh, for a teacher. Uh, but what they don't talk about is ethics. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. are on a mission to get 
every mm -hmm. educator preparation pro program in the country, mm -hmm. both traditional programs and alternative route programs, to adopt the model code of ethics for their institution. They can call it XYZ University College of Education Code of Ethics mm -hmm. if they want to. We mm -hmm. don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do want a citation, that's all we ask. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's free for them to use. They don't have to recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. But they need to let those candidates, those new teachers know mm -hmm. from day one that there is a code of ethics that will help guide you in the important work that you're about to, get, to undertake. That's so important. Right. We're, we're coming up on that part of our program where we can tell everybody how they can get a hold of a copy mm -hmm. of the uh, model code of ethics. So Phil, if you don't mind, maybe you can explain mm -hmm. it to the camera. Yeah. Uh, you can find the Model Code of Ethics along with a lot of different resources about how it was developed, who was on the committee, um, those kind of things are there. And we also provide a link that once you look at the Model Code of Ethics, if you want to mm -hmm. give us a message, if you mm -hmm. want to tell us how it can be improved, mm -hmm. then you can leave that as well. But you can go to www.nastech, that's N-A-S-D-T-E-C, mm -hmm. dot net hmm. and you will find it under the tab at the top of the page that says model code of ethics oh, that's great troy mm -hmm. if you'd like to further the conversation at all my email address is t hutchings at ets.org i'd love to hear from you i think one thing we've learned from, from the set is that the salacious things we see on tv is only just a small portion of what the mm -hmm. code of ethics really is about. Well, it's a much mm -hmm. broader document. Right. That's that's a really good point to raise. Yeah, it's exactly. about becoming a better teacher right. in a whole bunch of yeah. ways. This is not about uh, keeping bad teachers out of the classroom. Right. No. Uh, they they that's going to happen. This is about helping good teachers, mm. as Al said, mm -hmm. become great teachers, effective teachers, and more confident in their work as they have a road sign to help them navigate the decisions they make every day. Exactly. Phil Rogers and Troy Hutchings, thank you very much for joining us on Disrupt Ed TV. And hey. It's always a pleasure. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank great. you very Terrific. much. Really. Thank you. Really Phil, appreciate thanks it. So much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode. Uh, my name is Al Sini. I'm still Joe Asamendi. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again on a future episode of Disrupt Ed TV. Absolutely. Join us again. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.